O'Malley, Curtin and Chifley looking down as history is made in Canberra. And overthrow the bankocracy, reclaim financial democracy. Coming up in this week's episode of The Citizen's Report. Welcome to The Citizen's Report for the 5th of December 2023. I'm Robert Barwick and I'm joined today by Citizens Party Executive Member Glenn Isherwood. Welcome, Glenn. Thanks, Robbie. So, Glenn, you and I went to Canberra last week. We had, uh, we made a big impression, I believe, and we're going to tell the audience about it. Um, in the form of two subjects, one is the hearing of the Senate inquiry into bank closures. So we're going to go through that in a bit of detail mm -hmm. and because we gave testimony to that hearing. And we're going to update you on this RBA bill, which is Jim Chalmers giving up democratic power over the banks and saying the banks are now in charge and we're not going to let that happen. Um, so let's get straight into it. Before we begin, remember, um, you know, we produce the show, but we need your help getting it around. You can do that by liking the show, sharing it on your social media, subscribing if you're not a subscriber already. If you do, remember to ring the bell icon. Please comment below. We really appreciate your feedback, but it also gets the, you know, the conversation going. Um, and um, there's a donate button below that if, if you want to support what we're doing, you can click on that and donate. And we appreciate that very much. And we're going to play you a clip that actually where, where members of the Senate acknowledged what we do and the fact that we have to be funded in doing it and we do it ourselves. We don't take money from... Um, the usual sources that they do. But we'll highlight that when we get to that clip. Um, but Glenn, let's get into it. Mm. O'Malley, Curtin and Chifley, looking down as history made in Canberra. And by history made in Canberra, I'm begging the audience's indulgence here because we're talking about us now. The Citizens Party made history in Canberra because for the first time, we were invited to testify before a Senate inquiry, for the first time. And that's a very, very big deal. Now, I don't want to go through, can't go through all the details, but for the last five or six years, our party has been instrumental in getting up a whole bunch of Senate inquiries, getting legislation introduced into Parliament. We're working with people in the building across all the parties. But in order to do that, we usually have to take a back seat. Mm. Because... Yeah. And Robbie, I think it's important for our newer viewers to know what those inquiries and bills have been. Of course, there's the campaign against the bail-in laws, the powers bail that were passed. That was in the big one that started it. Valentine's Day 2018, um, we uh, successfully got an inquiry and a, a bill to amend that into Parliament. And in that case, Glenn, the inquiry we got up then was us working with the Greens to get that inquiry up. But, so the Greens moved it, and if it, the record shows the Greens moved it, they don't show our role, but it's an example of the sort of work that we're able to do. Prior to that, we had the campaign for bank separation, the Glass-Steagall bill that we wrote. That was introduced by Bob Catter and Andrew Wilkie. That also went to an, invest, an inquiry. Yep. And uh, in typical fashion, the major parties claim that our banks don't need separating. Um, because uh, reasons. Now, when that bill was introduced, some of us who were involved in preparing the bill were, na were named as individuals, but the party was not acknowledged because mm -hmm. just, just there's a political sensitivity about it, but that's an example. Mm -hmm. uh, furthermore, we had a, a proposal to break up the big four auditing firms. Yep. And That bill was introduced in uh, December 2019. And, of course, the big one that uh, in the more recent period was the uh, cash ban fight uh, to uh, prevent uh, Scott Morrison's $10,000 cash ban law from coming into effect. And we mounted a campaign together with John Adams, Martin North and others. That was an enormous campaign. And so what did the media do? Aaron Patrick in the Financial Review wrote an attack on John Adams and Martin North for associating with the Citizens Party. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, so there lots of slander in the major media on that one. Uh, and that bill was abandoned by the government, the coalition. Uh, they described it by the end as an orphan. No one wanted to own it. Mm -hmm. that, I mean, you had ministers running away from Liberal Party conferences because they didn't want to even face their own members over that one. Uh, and then, of course, the, uh, you know, the disgusting um, dismissal of Christine Holgate 
um, the attack on her and Australia Post. We, working with One Nation, got a, an inquiry launched. Uh, Pauline Hanson moved that one to investigate um, the dismissal of Christine Holgate. And a lot came out of that about the bullying and uh, yeah. this and and the fact that the banks had it. a hand in what mm. happened because Christine Holgate was pushing for a, a, a postal bank, and then that is another case where because of our role mm. we were viciously attacked in a Senate hearing in 2021, mm. and the licensed post office group was attacked for associating with us. Yeah, you, uh, as uh, as this show covered at the time, you were defamed. Yep. by Sarah Henderson and Kimberly Kitching. They ha hid behind parliamentary privilege to attack you and the party for our role in f standing up for licensed post offices and for Christine Holgate. Yeah, so, so I mean, that, that, captures, that captures most of it. But just to say that um, it's an example. We, we kept, all these years we've kept working. We, we, we work with all these different groups in the building and we talk to people in the major parties as well. But um, they're all really nervous about um, you know, because the Citizens Party were pretty focused on what we considered to be the number one power in the country, which is banking. And because we're focused on it and won't back off, and they're all subservient in their own ways to the banks, they get nervous about, well, if you're going to work public with the Citizens Party, you're going to get attacked. Mm -hmm. So that's what usually happens. And last September, we had a really significant forum in Parliament about a postal bank, um, and it was sponsored by the Licensed Post Office Group and um, mm -hmm. Senator Jared Rennick, Bob Catter was there, etc., but the Citizens Party didn't have a formal role for that reason. However, 15 months later and you know, many years later, we have just done something quite extraordinary and it had to be acknowledged because we worked with Dale Webster, the independent journalist, Martin North, etc., to get this inquiry up. And Glenn, this inquiry, the longer it's gone, mm -hmm. it's been going since February, has become more and more successful, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's got enormous traction. In the media, it's got enormous traction among the public. The senators on the inquiry, every time there's a hearing, they get a sense of how big this is. The chairman, Matt Canavan, described it as the most successful inquiry he's ever been part of because it has forced the banks to temporarily back down in some respects. And they're all pinching themselves thinking, well, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for that citizens party. And we've got some acknowledgement of that um, this week. So... Um, that was great to finally see that. And it was great that finally, because of our role, we were invited to testify in our own right. So we're going to go through a little bit of that. But before, and I want to go, we're going to play some excerpts from the hearing just to give people a, a, an appreciation of it. But, but just before that, um, we, did, we spent the week in Parliament. In the, so the hearing was on Friday last week and we spent from Tuesday to Friday lobbying in the building. And we had some very interesting yeah, three meetings. Days, three days to warm up. That's right. We, we had some very interesting meetings. Oh, it was raining all week too. I've, I've never spent time in rain in Canberra, but anyway, it was. Um, oh, and can we acknowledge our friend James who put us up? Mm -hmm. And we really appreciate James's accommodation. Very close to Parliament House as it happened. That was a really great contribution. We really appreciate James for doing that. Mm -hmm. James and his cat. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but... So we, when we talk about when we have meetings in Parliament, we can't give you the details in terms of the names, but we can give you a, a sense of the flavour. But there was one particular meeting I want to highlight, which was with a an advisor to a government minister. And what this meeting proved is how closely the government itself, but by government I mean the cabinet of the Albanese government, the executive branch of the government, the ministers, how closely they are following this inquiry. Because they know, politically we've proved our point, something must be done. They know that. But on the one side, they've got the power of the banks, which think they own, they, they have the divine right to rule, right? And the politicians usually treat them like they do and are always on their knees when it comes to the banks. So that, that's the dynamic they're used to. On the other side, though, they see the barbarians at the gate. They see a very angry population. They see things like, I mean, last night, Westpac went out, apparently. Online banking went down. For nine hours. A few weeks ago, it was Optus going down. Earlier in the year, CBA went down for, a, for a, a day, a whole day. And you've got these lunatic banks saying, everybody can go digital. That's the solution to everything, go digital. And they don't care about the consequences of that. And it's finally starting to dawn on these politicians, well, hang on, 
we better start paying attention yeah. to this, but, right? But who doesn't forgive those things is the uh, the stressed mother in the supermarket checkout with three kids and a trolley right. full of groceries right. who can't pay for them because her bank app and her bank is down so she can't access her money. And she has to walk no out of the supermarket without any food yep. for, that she planned a whole week shop around. So yep. uh, those people don't forget. You know, so the, the Optus outage, how many billions of dollars of um, lost income and revenue that was, that's um, still yet to come out of this inquiry. Uh, so in the government, inquiry, in yeah. the government, what we were told, and this is very important, is they're looking close at this inquiry and they're looking for, and here's the term, mm. it's a government management term, implementables. <laughs> now that, but, that's, but let's take that as a positive, right? They want things they can implement. Now, so what that means is we're hoping... laugh at the, these terms to, to, <laughs> to, to get these human beings to disassociate <laughs> from the real world with corporate lingo like that. Um, they well, should be saying, tell us what to do. And instead yeah, they say, give us implementable. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's like quantitative easing is money printing, but you know, yeah, you've, yeah. Got to, you've got to call it something stupid. Oh, that's right. Um, but, that, but we'll take, we'll, we'll, we'll put the best face on it. This is a good sign. We are hoping that the inquiry calls for a public bank. Mm. If it does that, this government will say, oh, their first reaction will be, that's not an implementable, but there'll be a bunch of lower order recommendations in there that it should also be done, and they will not have an excuse not to do them. So something good is gonna come out of this, I'm confident of that. All right, for the sake of time, let's now go through um, uh, some of the excerpts because mm -hmm. look the really signi the real history here and the reason we invoked O'Malley, Curtin and Chifley was this in this hearing um, on this day was the opening was dominated by the public bank solution. Mm -hmm. We got involved in this issue to push the public bank solution and it it was given the forum to dominate and not just from the citizens party but the signif signif citizens party was most significant. And when you know the history of the Commonwealth Bank and what Ben O'Malley did, and we're going to play your quote, actually, mm -hmm. so you don't have to say it now, but they can listen to it. Mm -hmm. Glenn, Glenn made this point in the hearing. What O'Malley did to get the Commonwealth Bank up, but then also what Curtin and Chifley did to fight for its existence and fight for it to be all it could be, which they finally achieved when they took government in World War II and they implemented the powers to make that permanent, Right, because this was the number one objective of the Australian Labor Party for most of its history until the last 40 years or so. Mm -hmm. um, then you really see how in we feel that we are um, uh, responsible to their legacy in terms of the fight that, that we've taken up for this, right? And the branches issue is one argument and a very good argument for the bank. So the first segment, the first clip I want to play is the opening statement of, which was in the first, um, the, 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 it was a jam-packed hearing, as you know, it started at quarter past eight in the morning, went till 5.30. So at quarter past eight, the two witnesses were the licensed post office group, Angela mm -hmm. Cramp, the executive director, and Scott Etherington, the chairman, and Emma Dawson from the independent public policy think tank per capita, which is actually, it's independent, but it's, it's on the labor side of politics. Um, and, Emma Dawson was the first to raise the public bank. So I want to play Emma Dawson's opening statement. But before I do, I have to, she's going to cite a report, which was her submission. And I have to acknowledge Emma because it was this report that got the Citizens Party going in this direction. The Citizens Party's fought for bringing back a public bank for, for ever since it was privatised. It was in August 2020, we read Emma Dawson's report on a public post bank. And that's what her report was about. Post bank, filling a void, mm -hmm. securing essential services. And that was the first time we'd considered that, hang on, that is the best and easiest way to do it. There's the post office, it's got the biggest network in Australia, 4,000 post offices, more than 4,000 post offices. Make them the branch for a public bank. And after all, that's where the Commonwealth Bank started as well. Yeah, right? and in that report, Robbie, the, the parallel of the, the and knowledge of the history of the precedent of the Commonwealth Bank was, you know, matched up with us, you know, completely. Yeah. And that was how it was, uh, you know, couched within the, the battle uh, for, for public versus private banking over the last century. So Emma Dawson had definitely done, you know, the right um, research uh, to, to come to that 
point for a postal bank. And it was in this context that, you know, the Commonwealth Bank actually started as a postal bank. And uh, as part of Glenn's preparation, he read King O'Malley's five-hour speech to Parliament in 1909. Not the whole thing, but... <laughs> <laughs> I'd ordered you to read the whole thing. <laughs> anyway, but it, this was a famous speech King O'Malley made back in the day before they guillotined speeches. He made a five-hour speech in 1909 for a national bank, but he was explicit throughout that speech. He always called it a post office bank, a national post office bank. Anyway, let's go to Emma Dawson. This was her opening statement advocating why this is the solution. Ms Dawson, did, did you have a brief opening statement as well? Yes, I'll keep it brief, Chair. Great, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, my name is Emma Dawson. I'm executive director of Per Capita, which is an independent public policy think tank. Um, and we'd go further than, uh, than the LPO group just did. Um, the Banking Royal Commission almost five years ago now found that many Australians didn't have ac adequate access to basic financial services. And even those who did are often ill-served by existing financial institutions. And this problem is particularly acute in regional and rural communities. Just as we would not leave the creation and maintenance of our health system or our roads entirely in private hands, we should not leave our banking services, financial infrastructure and financial stability entirely in private hands. The establishment of a public bank within Australia Post, a postal banking service, would, by operating within the existing infrastructure footprint of Australia Post outlets nationwide, provide banking services to Australians who are currently underserviced by the existing banking sector. With a social benefit mandate, such, such a bank could also improve banking services across the country by setting new standards for financial products and services that other banks will have to meet if they are to compete. Moreover, Postbank could ensure the continuation of postal services in remote and regional communities and underpin the ongoing viability of Australia Post services across the country. We propose a phased approach, which would begin with the opening of basic savings and transaction accounts in Postbank, followed by credit cards and personal loans, and then the introduction of mortgages, and I'll speak to that a little bit later as well. Um, we do believe that there's an, a, a good opportunity for um, a postal bank to offer longer fixed rate mortgages, which would um, alleviate some of the pressure brought to bear on households in times of um, volatile interest rate settings, such as we're seeing at the moment. A phased approach would allow a steady, staged rollout of new services, with profits and capital from one stage of the rollout funding the rollout of the next phase, and that would therefore minimise initial capital requirements from the public purse. A government-owned bank offers many benefits to Australians, including improving services for those currently underbanked customers, especially, as I said, in rural and regional areas, improving standards across the financial services industry, and providing stability to Australia's economy in times of volatility in international financial markets. Thank you. All right, so hats off to Emma and the role of per capita. And the, and, and the fact is, the other thing bears worth mentioning that she did, when she wrote the report, she did it commissioned by the, one of Australia's biggest unions, the Communications, Electrical and Plumbing Union. And that's significant because they're now in government. This is the Labor side of politics. These are their grassroots people. They're in government now. And so the, we're building a broad coalition of support for this. Mm. All right, the second clip is... Scott Etherington, the chairman of the Licensed Post Office Group, and we spent the day before with Scott and uh, Angela Cramp. Um, and when I, I don't have a clip of Angela's, but I, everything below, I mean, we'll put a link where you can go and watch all the hearings, but poor old Angela was um, losing her voice. So Scott did most of the talking. But I just want to play the clip where he's asked about um, the Post Office Bank uh, policy proposal and you can see what he says in response to that on behalf of the LPO group. Do you, do you think we should set up a, a government bank where they're using I, post offices? What's your view on that? I think the opportunity for Australia Post to leverage the, the network that we have and for the government to provide banking services to, to, to communities that are not profitable for these banks. They're not interested in serving a certain segment of the community that doesn't make them any money. And those customers could be served by a government bank. We'd be absolutely supportive of a government bank and using the Australia Post network as its agency to provide the services, face-to-face -face services. We think that would be an excellent solution. Okay. So you've got the largest business network. That was something that I should have taken, uh, assumed, but I didn't know, so thank you for Retail that. Retail network, yes. Retail network. <coughs> Um, and you support a postal bank as opposed to bank at post. You want to go beyond that and set up a proper a government-backed bank. 
uh, served through the post offices, yes. And you can see that the lack of competition that I saw in, when I chaired the Senate Select Inquiry into lending to primary production customers. The big four banks seem to have identical services, identical strategies, identical products, and they don't really have to compete. Uh, because it seems like an oligopoly. In fact, with their common ownership and controlling interests from BlackRock and Vanguard and so on, it would seem to be their one bank behind four logos. It feels that way sometimes. Okay. What about security of, of a full bank? How, how would you um, look after security? That's been put forward a number of times by people to, about why apparently we can't do this uh, banking transactions. We have been doing banking transactions for 100 years. And, and recently, with the, the banks that have closed in our area, we were turning over and doing more banking transactions than the actual bank outlets were doing. To be a bank, uh, to be a post office, we've got duress alarms, we've got time lock cash containers, we've got double lock safes, we've got we've got all those sorts of things, and we currently transact more cash than many bank um, branches today. So I think that point is moot, and any any additional security required is is not an impediment to making it happen. So you're not talking about being uh, skimpy, you, you're talking about making a proper bank, full security? We, we have the ability to do those sort of things that we do today. And if, if, you, if you walk <coughs> into a retail bank today, in one of these modern redone up make banks, you're often standing next to the teller and you're looking in the same cash drawer. When you come into my post office, you're standing on the other side of a 1.2 metre counter and there is a screen between you and me. If you want to compare security, I think the security is significantly better where I'm standing than when I'm standing in a bank branch. And I tell you, Scott, I, I think, um, I don't know what, if, if you have something to say, Glenn, but I would say, you know, we've, we've become supporters of the Licensed Post Office Group since we got into the Australia Post campaign. Mm -hmm. And Scott is our new chairman. We got to know the, 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 former, the first chairman, Andrew Hurst, really well. He was a great guy. Um, the, the change to Scott is... You know, hats off to them. The, mm. the the LPO group is in good hands. Well, Robbie, I'll just say about Scott and Angela is they represent the you know the mums and dads, the licensees of Australia Post. They have skin in the game more than anyone else. Yep. And the Australia Post board and the executive board, they're a political appointees. Uh, they you know they love Christine Holgate because she delivered. Yep. You know she rescued them from like a lot of the LPI the, group loved Christine Holgate. Yeah, yeah, uh, the devastating you know losses and and it was in in the realm of banking that Christine Holgate was promoting more um, more service and expansion of what Australia Post could do. And that, as you saw from the testimony, they would love that opportunity, but yep. they're being held back. They're being held back by politicians and. And you know, a penny pinching uh, accounting types uh, that uh, are running Australia Post into the ground, quite frankly, uh, and uh, they want to see it turned around. So they are the ones that are on the front line of this battle. So that's why they're so passionate. Yep. So you know, the, and that they are the most significant stakeholders in Australia Post. Collectively, mm. the LPO Group have put up about three billion dollars of their own investment to supply us with with postal services. And they know a postal, combining that with a postal bank would be good for all Australians. Mm. All right, um, now we'll come to us. This was our turn to present um, what we know about the public bank solution. And without being immodest, we know more than anyone else. I can absolutely <laughs> guarantee you that. This is what our party is known for for, for um, nearly 40 years. So. We'll play the clip where we're introduced by Matt Canavan because I want to hear you. I want to hear. You, I want you to hear Matt Canavan acknowledging us, and then we're going to play our opening statement, which I read out for the um, inquiry. But in Matt Canavan's acknowledgement, he does acknowledge that what we've done is at our own expense, and that's what I was referring to earlier. Um, our own expense, supported by our supporters. We do it with your support. So remember that donate button below. <laughs> All right, no more, no more plugging. All right, play the clip on that. Thank you, gentlemen. And uh, I do formally welcome uh, representatives from the Australian Citizens Party. And I, I do want to also thank and recognise uh, both of your efforts in both following the inquiry at, um, at some cost to yourselves all around the country and, uh, and also just your involvement generally. It's been very, very useful uh, and we appreciate your interest. I understand formally, I understand that information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses giving evidence to Senate committees has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please state your full names and the capacity in which you appear today? Robert Barwick, Research Director, Australian Citizens Party. 
Glenn Isherwood, Executive Member, Citizens Party. Great, and uh, you probably heard before, if you could keep any opening statement brief, that would be really great. Um, and Mr Barwick, do you want to kick off? I cheated by submitting a very long one. This is the abbreviated version. Great. Thank you, Chair and Senators. The Australian Citizens Party appreciates the excellent work of this committee and this opportunity to appear. Australia's exclusively private banking system fails the Australian people and the Australian economy. The system is dominated by the big four banks and Macquarie, which are too powerful, too concentrated and completely out of touch. They are making bigger profits than ever out of their customers, but they don't want to serve their customers. They are gaslighting Australians, claiming that when they are closing branches and removing ATMs, they are simply following our choices to bank online. But this inquiry has demonstrated they are closing profitable branches on which communities depend, severely disrupting and harming those communities. In truth, they are trying to force their customers into digital banking to boost the profits of the banks, not benefit the customers and communities. The only industry that can dictate to customers in this way is an oligopoly, a cartel. Everyone knows this is what we have. Last week in the Australian Financial Review, Alan Calder called it a bankocracy. As the 2004 Money Matters in the Bush inquiry declared, banking is an essential service. Therefore, it is up to Parliament and the government to ensure that Australia has a banking system that guarantees all Australians can access this essential service. Besides regulatory measures, the Australian Citizens Party urges this committee to recommend the Commonwealth Government re-establish a national people's bank, like the Commonwealth Bank before it was privatised, a government-owned bank to break the banking oligopoly and serve the community in ways the private banks won't and can't. In our view, there are various models, but the model for a public bank that would be most politically feasible, straightforward to establish and immediately effective is one that starts in post offices and expands as necessary. Only a people's bank will end the bankocracy and re-establish financial democracy. And we know a po public post office people's bank will stop the big four banks in Australia from closing branches because it's happened before. In 2002, when Kiwi Bank started, their banks, which are owned by our big four banks, stopped closing branches for seven years straight. They'd closed 1,300 branches in the two decades before that. There were no branch closes in New Zealand for seven years straight after Kiwi Bank was established. That's why we support this solution to this inquiry. And of course then, Glenn, we got to elaborate on that. And I'm, mm -hmm. and I'm gonna play, um, uh, I'm going to play that some, some of that another bit of that elaboration in a second. But first of all, I just want to play two parts of Malcolm Roberts first. So Malcolm Roberts opens also by acknowledging us. I just want to play that section. And I'll go to Senator Roberts first. Thank you both for appearing today, and and I want to also acknowledge and thank you for your party's work in the electorate generally, in the community, and also especially on infrastructure and banking. Uh, I've read uh, Craig Isherwood's The Australian Precedents for a Hamiltonian Credit System, an outstanding article. And that's, very, that's always mm. very decent of Malcolm. He, he's, Malcolm is one person in the building that has never been afraid to acknowledge the Citizens Party. But then this was, a, this was Malcolm's, I want to play now Malcolm's last question to the Citizens Party and both of our answers um, because it captures the, the essence of the debate here. So just run the clip. The last question the Chair's told me. Um, public banks have been enormously successful. The Australian, the, Craig Isherwood's article, The Australian Precedents for Hamiltonian Credit System, is a wonderful article for people to read. I've read other books about the Commonwealth Bank. Uh, it was amazing. What's stopping it now, uh, the old Commonwealth Bank? What's stopping a people's bank now? And is it the, the fact that the banks, the big four banks, currently hide behind regulations that are too complex, too too intrusive so that small businesses, other competitors cannot ha haven't got the legal horsepower to get, get into, the, into the regulations. I believe what's stopping it now is what caused it to be privatised in the first place. It's reflected in Chapter 27 of the Canberra Report. The report acknowledges the complaints of the private banks then that they had to compete with the public bank. They complained yep. about competition then and every time it's come up ever since, such as in the 2020 to regional banking task force report where there is a discussion 
of a public bank solution, the Regional Banking Task Force report dismisses that idea on the grounds of competitive neutrality, which is code for the banks not wanting to have to compete with a public bank. So my question to the committee, in, as a rhetorical question, given the behaviour of the banks, given what they've done to these towns, I think given that they have dealt themselves out of the debate morally, should that concern be what decides the outcome of this issue? I don't think so. Thank you. To add to that, Senator. Um, the Kiwi Bank example, there was a lot of resistance from the major parties in New Zealand to that bank being created, but it took the determination of one leader, Jim Anderton, to not take no for an answer. King O'Malley fought for the Commonwealth Bank for 30 years. He had to put together uh, the to torpedo brigade uh, of, of Labor members, but it took ruthlessness because he is up against very powerful banking corporations. He was then, and, and we are up against that today. They will leverage their concentration of the market, which is 80 per cent of all lending in Australia, to knock this down. So you do need a Jim Anderton, you do need a King O'Malley in this place to not take no for an answer, to take that determination forward. Thank you. <coughs> so, yeah, we could, look, we'll put the link to the, we put up the link already on YouTube. So if you're watching us, most people will be watching us on YouTube. Two videos ago, you can see, you can watch the full thing of our mm -hmm. testimony, the full clip, 27 or so minutes. Um, how did you think it went, Glenn, overall? Uh, very good. And the density of the amount of testimony given on the day um, it was, it took a lot to absorb everything. But my observation is this, the, the anger and the rage is so palpable in the population. It's not just people, individuals that are, uh, are pissed off at banks for closing branches and going cashless. It's now actual organisations and institutions, the LPO group. At yeah. the end of the day, Armaguard got up there and, you know, when or asked you know, about, um, you know, the banking arrangements, when, when banks leave town, Armaguard still has to go to those towns and they're make, now starting to post losses too. Uh, P, uh, Paul Graham from, from, the, um, from, from Australia Post board, he basically said that the bank at post is not adequate. Um, and they say it in in politically correct yeah. terms, but they're, they're not, not as happy. Forward as us. No. A and it's it's that we're getting to a, a critical um, mass out there, as you said before, where the parties know that they can't look away from this anymore. They need exactly. to be seen to be doing something. What's coming from the public is clear. This is the point. It's not just mm. it's not just background noise. Background noise. It's cl there's clarity. Mm. So I want to mm. play two more clips just quickly. One is. Um, the opening statement of Dale Webster, and of course, huge acknowledgement to Dale. Mm. Dale Webster, as a just an independent journalist who was also a concerned Australian who had a connection to banking because her dad used to be an ANZ bank manager and she spent time in the back backyards of banks in rural Australia growing up. She got a Walkley um, uh, grant to research this and what she found was absolutely alarming. And she happened to write her articles at the same time as our party was doing the Australia Post campaign and inquiry and starting to appreciate the significance of Christine Holgate saving banking services in towns. And so then we came across um, Dale's work and it takes extraordinary people doing extraordinary work to cut through. And she absolutely did. So in her opening statement, and she wasn't, um, she had some technical difficulties, so you can't see Dale on the screen, but... Uh, so this is audio, but she captures how she started to get a sense of how big the problem was out there in the various aspects of it. So we'll roll the tape on that. A really quick rundown on, on how I got into this. Um, I was a journalist covering regional bank closures um, in what I call the second wave of, of regional closures that started about 2015-16. Um, I was really sad when you're reporting on an issue like this. You see so many people who who are just so desperate to get get an outcome from these stories, and I just knew that there was there was nothing that they could do, and nothing that I could write that would make an iota of difference at a local level. So I spent a lot of time thinking about if there was a national impact 
to so many banks closing across such a vast geographical area. And my story um, published in 90, uh, sorry, 2021, Big Four Banks Cast in a Dangerous Shadow is the result. Um, cutting a very long story very short, in a nutshell, I found there was a strong argument that the banks, the lack of banks in regional Australia, coupled with the fact that there was more cash in circulation in Australia at any point in our history, had led to the to banking desert with thriving um, cash economy. And this isn't by choice, it's by necessity. Uh, banks just continue to vanish and the, the distance between them just is growing wider and wider. Um, I tried to contact the, the Reserve Bank and talk to the researchers of, of a, a report on, on cash and hoarding cash. Um, they weren't interested. Um, but officially they'll, they'll tell you that um, the missing cash is being hoarded. Um, but when you, we press them on it, they say it comes in and out of hoarding. And they can't track when this occurred. So my interpretation of this is that they've basically got no idea where the cash that they classify, um, whether the cash that they classify as hoarded is buried in a pin in the ground, as most people sort of assume hoarding is, or whether it's moving around towns in these banking deserts. Um, the reason they don't know where this money is out in regional Australia is one of the main ways that they, they had of tracking cash was bank deposits and withdrawals. Um, and that is no longer an attractive option when it's a 600 kilometre round trip or more to the next closest branch. All right, and then because you put a huge emphasis on cash um, and what's happening out there, uh, Glenn, because my, one of my points is I did a radio interview um, just yesterday and um, the, you know, there's all this infrastructure, banking infrastructure that's been closed down and, and it's the banks closed down and it's even the, the, tran the cash and transit carriers, they decide they don't want to service areas if they can get away with it, etc. But the assumption they'd like us to think is that means cash stops being used, and it doesn't. Mm. That, that was Dale's point. It doesn't. It has to be used more than ever. It's, just no, it's, it's not able to be used in a safe way anymore, mm. right? Because there's no security, there's no insurance, all those sort of all that, that infrastructure provided. Mm. So then, one of the the last clip I want to play, and I think this is an example of why you should um, get mad at superficial media reporting because. If you see a typical media story nowadays and for the last few years on cash, it's so superficial it's not funny. And they'll say, we're all moving away from cash, right? The, de the, the technical, technological uh, options are much more convenient, that's why we like it. And they put consumers in that category and they put small business in that category and you have these little, you know, white tap things in, in small mm. businesses now, etc. And more small businesses are going away from cash, etc. Et and never mind, Robbie, that the statistics show there's more cash in circulation in Australia now than ever in history. Also, one of the witnesses was the chairman of COSBOA, the Council of Small Business Organisations of Australia. Mm -hmm. And Malcolm Roberts asked him a question about cash. And this was his answer. Uh, just one more question about cash. Uh, are you, members of COSBO are concerned about the loss of cash, or would, do they prefer cash, neutral on cash, especially in the regions? What's their view? Senator, I'm yet to meet a small business who doesn't like cash. <laughs> cash will remain the cheapest way to transact. There is no other way around it. If, you, if, a, if a customer walks into a local supermarket with a $100, $100 bill, cash, it goes to the owner. That owner might then walk down to the um, local restaurant and buy a meal with that hundred dollars cash, uh, and you get this multiplier effect where you've all of a sudden you've generated two hundred or three hundred dollars. On the contrary, if we're talking about digital payments, and digital payments have their role, and I'm not a, I'm not a luddite, and I'm, and I'm none of that, but you did ask me the question: if that hundred dollars is eroded at every transaction by one and a half, two, two point two percent, then there's a compound effect there. Yep. 100 becomes 98 and a half, the 98 and a half becomes the 97 or whatever it might be. It, that, that is just the reality. There is a cost of transacting. And when you ask, um, our, you ask our small businesses, what's their biggest concern at the moment? It's the cost of doing business. There's a perfect storm of costs there. We're in a cost of living crisis, um, but we're also in a cost of doing business crisis. 
This doesn't get enough attention. It is extremely hard for people to churn out a profit. As I said, almost half of Australian small businesses aren't making a profit. High energy, high rent, high insurance, uh, and those merchant costs can, can add to that as well. So uh, long way of saying small businesses love cash. They love when customers come with cash. But equally, the ultimate goal is to delight their customers and where that is convenient for them to use tap and go, wherever it might be, of course, those provisions um, are available. But uh, there is absolutely cash is not dead in our view. Cash is king. Mm. Unequivocal. Small yep. businesses love cash. Stop this crap superficial reporting. Stop being a journalist and regurgitating bank propaganda. That's the horse's mouth. Quote those guys. All right. Um, and then a couple of other things just briefly. There were some regulators appeared. Now, I had stepped out of the room to do some media. Mm -hmm. But Glenn, you sat through the regulators. Mm -hmm. Were you impressed? <laughs> no. I mean, at one point, uh, uh, Gerard, Senator Rennick asked a question. How many hours does a bank branch need to be open to constitute in their data being a branch? And the response from APRA was time openings, uh, opening time is not a criteria we look at for, uh, uh, you know, in our branch data. <laughs> One hour a year. <laughs> One hour a year, it's still a branch, branch as far as they're concerned. So their data is not up to scratch. They've been called out by Dale Webster multiple times for, um, from sh for shonky data, not capturing what's going on. Uh, so uh, the fact that there was about nine people from the various regulators all you know stacked in together to, to answer this question, um, yep. they are not looking at any element of a community uh, standard. They admitted that the banks don't have, they have no power to enforce rules on the banks. They have a, a, a self-imposed banking code of conduct that, so unless the, the banks are actually actively deceiving on a product, asset can't intervene, and they, they're just handballing, buck yep. passing. And that's... And well, that's how someone described it to me, because there were so many people actually representing the regulators in the hearing, yeah. that in answer to the question, it was like, not my problem, mm. maybe that person, maybe And that's that by design, Robbie. That's, of course it's that's, by design. That's the way it has been since the mid-90s when, with the Wallace reforms and Costello's reforms. And when you see something by design, and I don't even get angry at the regulators or the banks. That is the government. That's a political will question. And that's why we exist to, to fight for policy changes to address mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, so look, there were other people that are worth acknowledging. We don't have time to play the clips. The small business om ombudsman was very impressive. Uh, Bruce Bilson, his name is actually a former small business gov um, uh, minister. minister. Um, the the people in the hearing who represented Indigenous Australians and what they're going through in relation to losing banking services. I mean, these are people whose job it is to provide counselling for Indigenous, you know, um, Australians who are, you know, um, uh, what's the term? You know, they're, they're disadvantaged. Mm -hmm. And instead, they said this addressing these practical issues of getting banking services is taking up more and more of their time. Right, all because there's four businesses that are exempt from every social um, uh, responsibility you can imagine. All the things that even closing the gap, four businesses, nobody imposes anything on them. We give them all the money in the world, we give them all our business, and nobody imposes anything on them. And so that's that's that that was all powerful testimony. Um, uh, and then next week we'll. I think, Glenn, we'll do some more on this um, cash movement question in Armagard, mm. but we'll, we'll leave it there because we're running out of time. But look, it was, it was a brilliant hearing. Um, the, the whole year has been brilliant. But again, just to reflect on us for a minute, which we don't often do, but today's our time. This was historic for the Citizens Party because we, we the Labor Party, spent most of a century fighting the money power and then surrendered. They called it the money power, then they surrendered. The Citizens Party started in 1988, and from the get-go, we started advocating for a national bank. And the more we learn about history, we learn about the Labor Party's fight for the money power. We adopted their fight, we adopted their language, the old Labor giants. And that's why we have been the prior party all along, because the money power is too powerful over the system. Anything else you hear about us is rubbish. We are the ones that are there to take away the power of the banks. Mm -hmm. And so historically, finally getting that acknowledgement and that mm -hmm. public position to be able to say our piece 
is enormous and it's thanks to our perseverance, it's thanks to the support of um, our viewers and our supporters. All right, so don't back down, keep it up. And now all we have to do next year is figure out how we're gonna to top this next year, Glenn. <laughs> anyway, all right, just quickly, moving on, time we've got left. Overthrow the bankocracy, reclaim financial democracy. And this is just a quick update on the question of the RBA re review um, implementation bill. So last Thursday, um, Jim Chalmers introduced the, the bill. It's called the Treasury Laws Amendment RBA Reforms Bill 2023. Um, the bill, uh, we had thought it would probably be re re referred to a, a legislation committee inquiry. It wasn't. Instead, it was deferred. Now, we're recording the show earlier this week. Um, Wednesday night this week, that inquiry, they call the Selection of Bills Committee, will meet again, and they will either refer it to a committee or continue to defer it. There's a greater chance they'll continue to defer it because nobody wants to have an inquiry over Christmas, right? Because then that becomes a superficial inquiry as well. So what may happen here is that this bill is deferred until, say, February, and then next time it comes up, it will be referred to a committee of inquiry then. And then you'll get another few months to have an inquiry. We'll ask our viewers to make submissions to that inquiry when the inquiry is on. It's not on at the moment, as I said. Um, and then we, we're giving ourselves maximum time to fight and defeat this, the sections of this bill that take away democratic authority over the banking system. Now, one comment, Robbie, on that. <coughs> this bill surrenders our democracy, the treasurer's powers over the Reserve Bank. It hands uh, all monetary fin fiscal decisions to an unelected uh, bureaucracy at the Reserve Bank. And in many ways, it's, it's parallel with what we're fighting with bank closures. We have a government that hasn't even inquired into bank branch closures for 20 years. They uh, impose no obligations on the private banks. They're, you know, what they decide is what they get. Yep. And so we've surrendered, um, you know, accountability on the big four banks. Now the government's turning around and saying, we're going to surrender any powers that we have to compel the central bank to, uh, to uphold the common good. It's, you know, handing the keys of the kingdom away. So it must be defeated. So we're talking to the, um, the there are parties in the building who share our opposition to this bill mm. and are opposed it. And we're, we're coordinating with them. Um, one of the things that came up in one of our discussions with one of those parties is who actually called for this power to be removed? Given that, it's a, it's a power that's been there. The power that allows the Treasurer to overrule the RBA has been there for 72 years and it has never been used. In that time, why was removing that power the number one recommendation of this Royal Commission, of, of this review? And so we thought, well, let's go through the submissions to the review and see who in the submissions called for it. Well, so we've done that. Um, one of our researchers, Melissa, went through all the submissions. None of the submissions, or the, the ones that are published at least, actually have a demand that this power be removed. And if that's the case, none of the public engagement around this review is calling for this. This is a backroom deal, and it's an international backroom deal. But um, what has come out of the submissions is quite interesting. And one of the things that we've discovered is the Australia Institute submission. Can I just put that in big flashing red lights, Robbie? No Australian, no member of the Australian public in this review of the RBA's powers yep. asked for this power to be removed, a power not used for 70 years. Yep. So that is the question. Who did ask for it? Yep. And we do know it's the Bank for International Settlements. Well, that's, how this, that's, that's what this is all about, right? Um, and we'll do, some more, we'll, we'll, we'll do a whole feature on that um, in the not-too-distant future. I want, to, I want to reference the Australia Institute submission specifically, mm -hmm. though, and this is another one of those think tanks, public policy think tanks that's on the labour, more on the labour side. Um, so that's what's especially relevant now. Um, and it actually goes after the RBA in its submission and it makes points about, you know, there's no confidence in its monetary policy in terms of fighting inflation. The real world is not the same as the RBA thinks. Its forecasts are wrong, its expectations are wrong. Then there's this quote, it goes, the idea that the central bank should not lend to government is interesting. It reflects a view that the central bank should be independent and not allow the elected, not allow the elected government to do things that the central bank might disapprove of. Remember, one's elected and one's not, right? 
Elsewhere in this submission, we argue that central banks should not be independent and should certainly not thwart the actions of a duly elected government. So you've got something with the imprimatur of the Australia Institute now coming out, as we have for years, attacking this scam of central bank independence. Um, and then it, went, then it goes on to advocate the RBA should operate a retail facility. And that's actually one of our models, Glenn, for a postal bank. The simplest way to have a postal bank would be to say to the RBA, start a retail site, which is what the Commonwealth Bank was, right? Start a retail site and run it through post offices. And Bob's your uncle, it's the biggest, most powerful bank in Australia and it's already there, right? And we're making a national bank again. So we've now got um, that being echoed by the Australia Institute, which is great. But we are seeing more voices come out in opposition um, to this. And I just want to, one I want to highlight, and what we'll do below, producer has put a link to the ABC radio interview of Peter Martin. Now, Peter Martin is a long-term ABC co economics commentator. And if you don't know him by name, if once you hear his voice, you'll recognize his voice because it's often on radio or, or on um, ABC News, etc. He's currently the visiting fellow of the Crawford School of Public Policy at ANU, and he's also an editor of um, The Conversation nowadays. And he in, on the 28th of November wrote an article, governments have been able to overrule the Reserve Bank for 80 years, why stop now? And then he does an interview um, on, on this article for ABC, we'll put the link to the interview below. Um, <coughs> but he's making the point that, he said, pay, pay close attention enough to Parliament these next days and you're likely to witness something truly remarkable. Politicians from both sides of politics uniting to remove the power of politicians to overrule the Reserve Bank. As an instance of self-loathing, it's hard to top. Sure, a good many of us don't trust politicians, but surely politicians ought to trust politicians. Surely politicians ought to realize that we put them there to make decisions. Not usually the day-to-day -day decisions, but the ultimate big decisions. They are meant to be where the buck stops. And then he goes after Jim Chalmers for wanting to wash his hands of responsibility for the RBA. Now, that's part of it. That's not the whole picture. The big picture is, is this um, what happens through the Bank for International Settlements in our view. But there is an element where people like Jim Chalmers, every time the Reserve Bank has raised rates in the last year, he has looked very unhappy and he's given press conferences that have made him sound very unhappy. He mm. sided with the people against the banks but it's all been for show because all along, he has had the power to overrule the Reserve Bank. He could have said in 2022 to the Reserve Bank, you're not gonna raise interest rates anymore. We had the most vicious interest rate rise program in history, smashed all these people all, all that are their eyeballs in debt. All predicated on uh, stopping inflation, which it has not done and cannot do. Of course. Because our decisions, Robbie, you and I and, and everyone watching, it doesn't matter what we do. It's not going to change the inflation because it's, we are not the cause of that inflation. But they're imposing the pain on us through the increased interest rates. Well, as and, and as Dale Webster said in her opening statement there, though, these, like Michelle Bullock from the Reserve Bank, continues to blame inflation on the people. And if Jim Chalmers really represented the people, he could step in and say to the RBA, no, no more interest rate rises. We, the government, will solve inflation in other ways, such as by investing in the things that can make the provision of our goods and services more efficient and therefore cheaper, etc., 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 better infrastructure, those sort of things, get the cost down that way. That's what he could have done. But that means taking responsibility to actually do something, to actually govern, and they don't want to take that responsibility. They are, these people are not men. They are midgets. They are mental pygmies. And, a, a, and that's, a, that's bipartisan. That's across the two major parties. And our country is going down the gurgler because of it. And now you've got someone of the stature of Peter Martin coming out and, and in a very hard-hitting way going after the government on this. So we've, we've, that, that adds to the existing voices that have also criticised it. P Paul Keating, Bernie Fraser, people like that. Mm -hmm. They're all criticising the, the abrogation of democracy here, right? in favour of, if you don't have democracy over your banking system, you have a banking dictatorship. That message is getting through, very, very important. So back to what I said earlier, 
Um, we have, we will know later this week and our party will update on our website, etc. If we have a Senate inquiry start this week, we will mobilise people on that inquiry. More likely, something will happen in February. So in the meantime, we will keep building the opposition to this bill because parallel to the bank branches inquiry, where we're trying to get a positive proposal recommended, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this is a fight to stop a bad policy, right? And we are in a position to actually stop it, but it's going to be the fight of our lives. So um, stay tight in formation and be ready for those phone calls and emails and all those other things that we need to do that make that happen. Anyway, we've run out of time, Glenn. Um, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, thanks Robbie. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me last week in our favourite city. Someone's got her. No. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's not the worst, but it's the only, it's the only black mark, I must say, on King O'Malley's record. <laughs> <laughs> well, we made it out alive. So. We made it out alive. Um, no, no, it was great. We've made history and we're going to keep making history. So, and that, again, like I said, is also thanks to the viewers. So thanks for, thanks for sticking with us. Um, thanks for tuning in and see you next week for more of the Citizens Report. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party, Melbourne.